Hi, this is the nervous system lecture number one that goes with the holes, essentials of anatomy and physiology textbook. In this lecture, we will be covering an introduction to the nervous system, nervous system function, uh, neuroglia, neurons, and um, structural and functional classification of neurons. So quick introduction, the nervous system is the master control system for your body. It's what keeps you feeling, thinking, moving, aware of what's going on. It coordinates your body functions, keeps your body in balance, uh, which is homeostasis, and responds to changes, whether in your internal or your external environment. The main cell type is the neuron. Um, there are other supporting cells called neuroglia, um, but neurons are the, uh, the main character basically, and they communicate to one another with electrical impulses. So our bodies can actually move ions around and generate electricity, and these impulses are what send a message from one neuron to another um, and eventually to each and every body organ. Um, the neuron has three main parts. That's the cell body called the soma, an axon, one, just one, and then many dendrites. What we call a nerve in common speech is actually a bundle of the axons of many different neurons. Um, we also call each axon a nerve fiber. And this is a little bit different from um, when we were talking about muscle fibers, okay? Neurons communicate with one another or with their um, organ that they're attached to via a structure called the synapse. So there's the neuron actually doesn't touch each cell, uh, but it comes close. And then there's what we call a synapse there. And it's important that the neurons don't touch one another or the organ because uh, if they did, then the impulse, it would be difficult to stop it. There would be a lot less control. Um, so think about when you shock yourself, how you tighten all your muscles for as long as the electricity is going, it would be something similar if your synapses were actually touching. Instead, the neurons come quite close to one another or their um, effector organs, and they send messages via chemical signals called um, neurotransmitters. Um, there are lots of them. They're very complicated. We're not going to go that in depth um, in this course. Um, and in fact, scientists are still trying to figure out the exact mechanisms of many of them because neurotransmitters can affect one part of the brain differently than they affect other parts of the brain. But if you think of neurotransmitters kind of like sounds, we humans flap our tongues and vibrate the air with them and our or vocal folds, and we combine different sounds together, phonemes together, to make words, to make sentences, to convey meaning. It's the same thing. Neurotransmitters are just like sounds, but they're chemicals. Here is a slide of a neuron. Um, it's stained. It's not naturally this color. Um, would stain to be this kind of pinkish purple, but here is the cell body, the soma. Here's the one axon coming off, and there are many dendrites coming off here. And all these little darker purple spots, these are the nuclei of neuroglia, the supporting cells, and we'll get to those in a, in a bit. So the um, nervous system can be divided into two major groupings we call the CNS and the PNS. So the central nervous system or the peripheral, and they're named logically. So the central nervous system are in the center of the body, and it's the brain and the spinal cord, and that's it. Those two organs make up the entire central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is made up of all the nerves that go from the CNS out to all the organs in the body. Functions of the nervous system, there's three main functions, sensory, integrative, and motor. And we'll talk about those a little bit more as we come go, go along. Um, but sensory picks up sensations from the environment, internal or external. 
integrative decides what to do with those signals and then motor takes that decision out to the effector organ. Nervous tissue besides the neuron also contains neuroglia and it took us a while to discover these cells. The neurons came first. The neuroglia is a general name for all of the other cells in nervous tissue that support the neuron. So these are cells that provide nutrients to the neurons, they insulate neurons, and they physically support the neurons uh, in a scaffolding type structure. So here's a diagram of the nervous system. So here's our PNS, okay? It's right in line with the axial skeleton. It's the most well-protected organ, the brain, and the second most well-protected organ, your spinal cord. And then the PNS is over here. And this is further subdivided into two divisions. So we have a sensory division and a motor division. This would, the central nervous system is the integrative division. Okay, and you see there's arrows. So the neurons only work in one direction. So we have sensory receptors throughout our body. Those neurons send a message to the sensory division of the PNS which sends a message to the CNS, the brain or the spinal cord decide what to do. And then they send a message back out via the motor division and that's further subdivided into somatic or autonomic. And then that sends, the motor division sends an impulse out to the effector organ, depending on what it is. So for example, let's say you're out on the savanna and you see a lion running at you. So the sensory receptor would be the uh, rods and cones in your eyes. Send the message to the sensory division up to your brain. The occipital lobe is going to interpret that and go, oh my, perhaps we should run away. So then it will send a message to the motor division, specifically your, well, both the autonomic and the somatic. It'll send one message through the somatic to the skeletal muscles of your legs and say, run. And then your autonomic nervous system will also be triggered. This is your fight or flight reflex system. So it's gonna uh, tell your digestive organs to stop digesting because we don't need to waste energy on that right now. It'll tell your heart to speed up. And it's also gonna tell your adrenaline glands to release adrenaline, which will further uh, aid in this so that hopefully you survive this line. That was a brief overview. Here it is a little bit more in depth. So you do have sensory receptors, sensory neurons at the end of your peripheral neurons, and these gather information and convert it to a nerve impulse. And the nerve impulse is basically an action potential. So in the example I gave you, the sensory input is light. The light waves hit the rods and cones in your eye. The light waves get converted into the action potential. So like it's converted into a series of chemical uh, signals. If it's hearing the sound waves, vibration of the air is what gets converted into the chemical signal. Um, if it's in your skin, we have pressure receptors. They convert the physical touch into a signal. Um, if it's taste, the molecules that you're eating physically lock into a, a taste receptor on your tongue or in your nose smell, they're pretty closely connected to send a signal to your brain. And there are many, many, many others. It's not true that we have five senses, we have hundreds. These impulses travel the peripheral nerves until they reach the CNS. And the CNS is not always the brain. Some impulses only go to your spinal cord. Uh, a lot of reflexes are handled that way. Like, um, you know, if you stub your toe or you're about to drop something on it and you pull your leg back, that would be a, a spinal cord reflex. But there in the CNS, all those sensations are put together and compared against a memory or thought or a reflex, something innate, converted into a perception of what happened and then a decision is taken as to what to do. That's the integrative function. And then once the decision is taken, another impulse is then conducted along the appropriate peripheral neurons to the appropriate effector organs. And it's either going to be a muscle or a gland, in this case, um, that will perform actions in response. So if it's a muscle, 
it's going to contract. And if it's a gland, the gland is going to secrete a substance that will do a thing, usually a hormone. Um, so if the, the uh, sensory receptors pick up that you've got high blood glucose in your cardiovascular system because you just ate, the integrative function will decide to trigger the pancreas to release insulin, a hormone that will um, remove glucose from your bloodstream and put it elsewhere. And then the motor functions can be further subdivided. The somatic nervous system is voluntary. You consciously control your skeletal muscles for the most part. Reflexes you don't, like a reflex to duck. But for the most part, this is voluntary. Um, in the example with the lion, you running away. Okay. Or if you know your teacher says, get out a pen and paper and take notes. Okay, your your uh, somatic nervous system would trigger the trigger the muscles in your arms and hands to to start writing. The autonomic nervous system. This one's easy. It's automatic. It's under involuntary control. So this nervous system is what controls your cardiac and smooth muscles and your glands. Um, so it, help, it controls your heart rate, your smooth muscle, uh, which is found all over, and then the glands, which release hormones. Okay, so in this section, we'll talk about the different neuroglia. You do need to know each neuroglia by name. Sometimes these are called glial cells. Glia from neuroglia. Neuro is for nervous tissue. Glia is the supporting cell. Um, so neurons cannot function alone. They need these neuroglia in order to do their job. Um, just like in a school, teachers can't function alone. Teachers need um, custodians. We need uh, uh, the lunch ladies. We need uh, administrators, the principal and vice principal. Um, we need financial secretaries. We need all these things to help you know, our job because it's not my job to pay the light bills to keep the lights on in here. Same thing with the neurons. The neurons are really good at sending impulses, but they're not good at much else. So the neuroglial cells um, perform this function. Okay. They structurally support the neurons, like physically hold them in place because the axons and dendrites are really delicate. They make myelin, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but it's a coating over the axons. They nourish the neurons. They, well, they help to nourish the neurons by determining what comes in and out of the bloodstream. And they also protect the neurons from debris or possible infection through phagocytosis. And the neuroglia have the ability to divide, so they can go through cell division, but neurons, for the most part, cannot. There's some new research in this area that in certain parts of the brain, I believe it's the hippocampus, there's some neuronal cell division um, but that's the exception to the rule, and again, it's still new. But uh, in general, if you get a brain tumor, you get the brain tumor from the neuroglia having a cancer, not from the neurons. The neurons typically don't divide because they um, need to stay in place to be doing all of their functions. Now, the neuroglia can be divided up based on where they're located. So in the central nervous system is where we're going to see the most uh, diverse neuroglia. So the first example is called microglia or microglia. You can say it either way. These are tiny cells and what they do is go through phagocytosis and eat. That's what phagocytosis is. They take in bacterial cells and other cellular debris like worn out proteins or neurotransmitters that have been degraded. And the microglia um, digest those and clean up everything. They're like the garbage men of the brain. Um, they can also produce scar tissue when you have injuries. Um, so like, for example, if you were to experience a concussion um, or, or a more severe injury, like if you, uh, like Phineas Gage, if you had a railroad spike go through your brain. Okay, the next one is called oligodendrocyte. Dendro for like dendrites, okay, and cyte means cell. So these cells form a myelin sheath around axons that are found in the brain or in the spinal cord. So oligodendrocytes 
physically wrap themselves around the entire neuron. So the axon, the dendrite, um, and the soma. Okay. The myelin sheath is, it serves to help insulate the neuron. It makes the speed of its impulses faster and more efficient. Um, you could think of it like how you have a coating around wires. Like if you plug in your phone to charge it, it's not bare metal, okay? The coating on the outside helps to uh, protect the electrical signal. Um, if you've ever broken that barrier down, if you have gaps in your cord, um, you'll notice your phone charger doesn't work as well. And if you touch the bare parts, you'll get a shock. Same thing here. Next, still in the central nervous system, we have the astrocytes, astro for star, site for cell. So they're star-shaped cells. These cells, um, they're, they're found between different blood vessels and neurons, so the capillaries and um, venules and arterioles in the brain. Um, number one, they provide structural support. So they physically like wrap, um, along, not wrap, but like they, they uh, support along parts of the neuron that need to be held in place. And then they also wrap around um, the capillaries, the blood vessels, and form what's called the blood-brain barrier. So they prevent most items from getting through the blood because the brain needs to be so protected. So it only lets in um, certain items. So like oxygen it will let in and carbon dioxide it will let out. Um, and this is to protect you in the case of infection. If you got a blood infection, you wouldn't want that uh, bacteria or whatever pathogen it is crossing into your brain and infecting your brain. If you do get an infection in your brain, that's very serious and can often be fatal. That might, uh, you might get meningitis or encephalitis as a result, uh, both of which involve a swelling of the brain or the meninges around the brain, which is very bad uh, if you, you know, like being alive. Um, the astrocytes also do help with um, scar tissue as well, forming it in case of injury. Next, you have ependymal cells. So these cells line the inside of ventricles, more about those later, but those are empty well, not empty, but they're, they're spaces in between nervous tissue that's filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Um, but the epidemal cells line the inside of these ventricles and then cover over the choroid plexuses within the ventricles. And these are the areas that make the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, moving on, the neuroglia found in the peripheral nervous system. This one's easier, it's just the Schwann cells. The Schwann cells produce the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. So there's a picture coming up. Um, they're smaller than the oligodendrocytes. And what they do is they flatten themselves out like a pancake and then they wrap themselves around the axons of these neurons. Um, if you can imagine like a jelly roll or if you took a piece of paper and wound it up over a pencil, that's kind of what they do. Um, but the swan cells are smaller, so they kind of look like beads on a necklace. And they drastically increase the speed of impulses, which is important. Because if you think about it, um, just like, you know, you have long uh, muscle fibers, you have long axons on your neurons. So your uh, sciatic nerve that leaves your spinal cord and your lumbar area of your back, goes all the way down to your toes. Okay, that's a long way for a cell to transmit information. So the faster you can do that, the better. Now some people get a disorder um, called multiple sclerosis in which their body, it's an autoimmune disorder, so their body attacks their own cells and specifically the Schwann cells. Some people who have this disorder will start to lose uh, fine motor control and eventually gross motor control if it, if it were to keep going unabated um, because the Schwann cells are being deteriorated. Thankfully, we have much better treatments for this now. Um, and if you can stop the body from attacking um, by using immune suppressors, 
um, then the Schwann cells will regenerate and it will help alleviate the symptoms. However, it's not perfect fix. There's always drawback and the, the drawback when you're on an immune suppressor drug, you're more likely to be at, um, to get sick from other means. You know, you're more susceptible to like colds and flus and you know other illnesses. So it, it does have to be closely monitored, but um, it is progress. So here is a diagram of all the neuroglia. So here's the neuron. This is the, the main player. Okay, there's the cell body. This here is the axon. These little ones are the dendrites. Here's an oligodendrocyte. You can see it's wrapped around the axon and wrapped around the cell body here. Um, I do not see a Schwann cell on here. This is similar to how a Schwann cell would look, but it's the oligodendrocyte. But if you cut away, this is what I was talking about. And you imagine like a jelly roll. Okay, the oligodendrocyte as well flattens itself and wraps around to form this violin sheath. And you'll notice there's gaps here. They're called nodes of Ron VA. And what will happen is as the impulse comes this way, it'll actually arc between. So it, it can kind of leapfrog its way down. It's actually really cool. Here's a microglia, so it kind of looks like a little snowflake. Here's the astrocyte. It's supposed to be more star-shaped, but you can see it's supporting the neuron here. And here it's forming the blood-brain barrier along this capillary. Here are the ependymal cells. These ones look a little bit different. They have cilia on one side and they line this ventricle and this is what would have the uh, cerebrospinal fluid in it. Okay. Moving on to the neurons. The neuron contains a cell body, it's called the soma, and it has all the organelles in it that you know your typical cell would have. Um, it also has dendrites, many dendrites, and one axon. Um, the dendrites and the axon are held in place with uh, branches of the cytoskeleton and these can actually grow um, as you use a pathway, a neuronal pathway. Um, the neurons and the dendrites will actually physically grow outward and get closer to the other neuron that they're making a synapse with. And this is um, what we call learning. You make it physically easier for these neurons to communicate by physically growing them closer together, um, but it takes practice to do that. Um, they are directional. So dendrites receive signals and they send the impulse or the signal towards the cell body. There's a lot of them, they're short and branching, and they connect up with other neurons. Now the axon, there's only one, and it conducts impulses from the cell body to the next neuron or effector organ if it's the last neuron in the chain. Where it connects to the cell body is called the axon hillock, and that's where all the, the sum total of the signals that the dendrites receive collect at the axon hillock. And then it's an all or nothing. So if there's enough to reach a certain threshold, then the axon sends the impulse down to the next neuron. And the cell bodies, um, they have the typical organelles. They have a lot of mitochondria because they're very busy uh, and greedy energy-wise. Um, they have a special name for their rough ER. They're called missile bodies. Um, and they have a large nucleus. Okay. Large axons get myelin sheaths. Not all, so like the gray matter of the brain doesn't have a myelin sheath, but the white matter does. Um, and it's many layers, I already talked about this. The outer layer of myelin, so outside of the Schwann cells or the uh, oligodendrocytes, they're surrounded by something called a neurolemma. It's analogous to um, the connective tissue coverings of muscles. So it's a protection, okay, uh, around. And then um, the gaps that I told you about are called nodes of Ronvier. 
here's a diagram. So this would be a PNS neuron because it has, these are the Schwann cells here. And notice the axon actually splits into two here and then several at the end. These are called um, synaptic knobs and this area is the axon terminal. It's still just one axon because it only leaves the cell body at one place. Larger in diameter axons are typically myelinated, but smaller in diameter axons are typically unmyelinated. So if we're talking about this CNS, if there's a myelin sheath, we call it white matter. And that's because it physically looks white if you were to do a dissection because the myelin sheath is mostly phospholipids. The cell has flattened itself out and made a, a large phospholipid bilayer, which is a fat. If you've ever seen, you know, fat like on a steak or something, it looks white. That fat helps insulate the neuron, keeps it from losing its ions that it uses to generate electricity. These CNS regions that have um, only the cell bodies or unmyelinated axons, these are called gray matter because if you drain the blood out of the brain, you were to dissect it, it looks gray. Okay, and then there's a close up so you can see the myelin sheet. So we have here, there's cytoplasm on the inside, but then the edges, each of these little lines in the spiral is a phospholipid, or part of the phospholipid bilayer. Now, if you damage a neuron in the PNS, they are able to regenerate or replenish their axons. They can grow them back because the Schwann cells can help guide the, the regrowing parts together. Um, it's slow. It doesn't happen overnight. It's very slow. Um, but if it happens in the CNS, they usually don't regenerate because they don't have those the Schwann cells that make up these nodes to help connect them back together. Now you do have um, some stem cells. There, there are stem cells all throughout the body, um, but your neural stem cells are located in the hippocampus and these can produce new neurons or neuroglia in certain chemical environments. There's a lot of research into this now because um, the hippocampus is like uh, emotional control and memory area um, and it has to do with um, like short and long-term memory so there's there's it's complicated and we don't know enough about it so there's a lot of research into that area to figure out why why does this one area have this ability but not the other now neurons can be classified based on their structure so how they look or on their function, so what they do. So there's three of each and they kind of go together because structure reflects function. So for structure, they can be uni, bi, or multipolar. So what you have to do is look at the cell body and count how many things come off of the cell body. If it's one thing, then it's unipolar. If it's two, it's bipolar. And if it's multipolar, there's more than two. Um, so by things, I mean extensions. You have to count up the axons and the dendrites. So if you look here, this one's a unipolar. It only has one extension coming out and it's actually split. This whole part is the axon. This little bit is the dendrite. Um, usually you find these in the CNS more. Uh, the this one in the middle it's kind of rare this one's bipolar so there's two you have a dendrite you have an axon uh typically you find these in the eye uh, you have your photoreceptor that connects to a bipolar neuron that then connects to the optic nerve and then this one is th this one's the most prevalent in the body this is the multipolar so you have the one axon and many dendrites here and if you classify them functionally, you have the sensory or afferent neurons. These conduct impulses from the peripheral receptors to the PNS, excuse me, the CNS. Um, usually unipolar, but sometimes they're bipolar, it just depends. Um, then you have the interneurons. 
sometimes called association neurons or integral neurons or internuncial neurons, just a confused thing. Um, so these are multipolar neurons within the CNS that form links between other neurons. Um, and then you have the motor neurons, which is also called efferent neurons. And these are also multipolar that can conduct impulses from the CNS to the peripheral nervous system organs. Okay. And here's a diagram showing you. Okay. And that's the last slide for uh, the first section of our notes in chapter nine.